Welcome to Tech This Way. How are you? Hey, good man. Thanks for Thank the you. thanks for the call. Oh, thank you, thank you. I've so never done a podcast before, so I'm really excited. But please go easy on me. <laughs> well, I've never done one uh, on a video call, so it should be interesting. Yeah, yeah. I was just thinking, right? Because this whole COVID thing is just getting out of control. Everything's on lockdown. Try as much as possible to just get on with life. So in Singapore, it's the same thing. Everybody's uh, working from home pretty much. Yeah, yeah. We, we kind of started a little earlier. So it started with the banks and the civil services. Uh, of course, they are a lot more well established. So when government gave advisories, they started split up. So mm. uh, for the wife who worked for a bank, uh, for the last two weeks, she's been working from home. Then the entire team is basically rotating. So part of the team, two weeks away from home, then they go back to the office. The other half goes back goes to work from home. I don't know about this rotation thing, right? Because it seems like it's giving everybody a chance to get the virus. <laughs> I think a lot of it is really just being civic-minded, I suppose, you know. Just I mean, there's, there's one thing to be fair, right? Okay, like, it's not fair for just one group to be working at the office. But on the other hand, it's also not fair to try to infect everybody. Yeah, I, I, I agree. But it, You've got to you got to start somewhere, and I think I, I think Asia and Singapore are doing very good things. I mean, it takes a lot of gumption from the government, you know, to say oh, yeah. okay, let's let's do the lockdown because the economy implications is the fallout. You, you could just think about you know how bad it's going to be, yeah. but yet you have it. You have to bite the bullet. You've got to have this kind of hard lockdown so that you limit people's uh, movement and as much as possible try and contain. So hopefully we didn't do these two weeks. You know, Malaysia really can contain, and then the border restrictions can be lifted. Yeah, hope so. And we can go into that a little bit in terms of how that's going to impact you guys. Um, but before we go there, um, P54. So I first I first heard you guys from one of my uh, LinkedIn pop-ups, um, and then I say, oh, and then it's all about you know agri tech, which is not something I'm familiar with. So mm -hmm. perhaps we could start with you as uh, Chris Fong, a little bit of background, how you got into this, and then we can go into P54. And a cool right. name too, P54. P54, uh, yeah, so um, the, let's start with the origins of the name. So P54, um, there's this children fairy tale, you know, Jack and the Beanstalk, if you're familiar mm. with it. You throw a little magic bean in the ground, it grows in a huge beanstalk, it reaches the sky and the clouds, and there's a giant castle with golden eggs, or geese laying golden eggs and giants running around. And the giants in the story basically is famous for saying Fee Fi Fo Farm. Mm. So we wanted to have a word play around Fee Fi Fo, and the farms in our spaces are basically Fee Fi Fo Farm. So that's that's the origin. Uh -huh. okay. If you look okay. at our company. If you look at our company logo, it, it, it's a little small, but if you look at it, the details of it is it's really a beanstalk that's growing up and reaches a golden egg. Oh, okay. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So that, that really is the origins of it. Um, so what about so, what about the origins of Chris Fong then? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, it's interesting. I, I, I myself am not a, a farmer. So all my life, I've been in the corporate in the corporate sector. Uh, mm. I'm in the corporate, my background is in computing. Uh, then I got into uh, the corporate world and I started doing a lot of work around process development, technology reviews, uh, technology process and controls, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I did a lot of work around that, as well as consultancy around work around that. Uh, and that that really was uh, most of my life for 10, 12 years. So around 2016, 2017, I took a sabbatical to do a master's in uh, innovation. And then what, industry, uh, what industry were you in before Before you took your... Financial services, mostly. So I started my career in the big four. So I was in KPMG, I was in PwC. Then I moved on to financial services. 
Uh, mm. I worked for Stanchart, I worked for UOB, and and in the last stint in the purple world, I was working for GIC, which is the mm. sovereign wealth fund for Singapore. Yeah, yeah, that was that was right before I took my sabbatical. So I went to do a study, uh, masters uh, about innovation and technopreneurship. Okay. That uh, got me into the whole community of people that are thinking about how to use technology to do things differently. Uh, I even went to uh, Silicon Valley San Fran for a while to, to really soak in the atmosphere there. Why did you uh, so around, Why did you leave GIC? I don't know. I, I suppose I was looking for what's next. I mean, hmm. yeah, if you were in, if you're in the corporate world, um, you could really see the progression uh, for yourself. You know, two years from now, five years from now, ten years from now, and you could very easily articulate what you want to be in the future. I mean, there was nothing wrong with that. I was actually having quite a nice career. I was doing meaningful work. But there's always this thought at the back of my, my mind, you know, even right when I was much younger, before I started work, that I wanted to do something different, wanted to do something meaningful. Mm. It was around that time that this whole innovation startup thing started really exploding. And mm. many, many corporates were talking about, oh, how do we use innovation to do this, to disrupt that, and you know, all the cliche big buzzwords. Yeah. And in the tail end of my career, three, five years towards the end, there was a lot of projects in this space. And because of my function, that was looking into process, that was looking into controls. Many of these came my way and could really see, oh, this is, this is not just talk. You know, there are many, many areas where companies can really use technology to do things differently. So mm. that, you know, you, you either get some kind of a top line or a bottom line benefit. Yeah. That got me thinking that, you know, I don't want to be at the sideline and, and, and watch things and look mm. at things and keep comments. I want to try and see whether it's possible or there's any opportunities for myself to really be involved. So I thought, okay, fine. Since I had that thought, let's, let's do let's do something, let's, let's do a master's about it first. Let's see whether or not, you know, you can get some mental scaffolding around how to think about innovation, mm. how do you think about using technology for good. And, and, that, and, and that was it, that was, and the rest was history. I, I, I bit the bullet, that was at a time where my wife was uh, pregnant, my second son. Brave. So everybody was like, are you sure you got a great job? You got, you got a great pay, you know, everything's going well. And you and you have a son, your wife is pregnant, and you're thinking about taking a sabbatical and doing a master's and getting into entrepreneurship. Like, well, the master's is, is confirmed. I am doing that. Whether or not I'm jumping into entrepreneurship, we will see. But as the matter turns out, I, I, I finally did. So there you go. So when you went out to do your masters, was the hope to go back into FI or it was just to go into the deep blue ocean? I think at the time I was open. At that time, mm. I probably had the mental assurance that, you know, if things don't go well, you know, with the masters like that, I could always go back into financial services, any of the banks that I've worked for and see if I could get mm. a job in the mm. innovation office, something like that. So I think with that, I was, I was pretty comfortable to take a step out. But one part of my mind was thinking, let's use this time to really figure out if there's anything you can do mm. that's worth doing. So what happened then? So around this time, I had a bunch of friends who just so happened to be all at that stage of life where they were looking to do something else. Mm. So these are all the founding members of the 354 team now. Uh, we have just six of us. Two of us are actually smallholder farmers ourselves. So uh, we, we, we are longtime friends. I mean, my CEO and I, we knew each other more than, I think, close to 20 years by now. His wife uh, is my childhood friend. So literally, I've known them. I've known him since my childhood friend has dated him. So that's how long we went back. And all these are connected mm. to each other through friendships for many years. Yeah. So two of these guys are smallholder farmers. Uh, and, and they have been in the industry in Malaysia for quite some years already. And they decided to, okay, let's come together and start a tomato farm together. Sorry, about so three and a half you're saying, sorry you're saying two of, two of the six were actually farmers already? Yes. 
Yeah. Okay. One of them actually have been. Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. One of them have actually been in the farming industry for 15 years by now, mm. and mm. What his family is one of the, the more advanced uh, uh, farms in Cameron Highland. So that's that's their background, and the two of them decided to start a tomato farm themselves three and a half years ago. And they wanted to grow mm. trust tomatoes. You know what trust tomatoes are? You have got those tomato no. nice, round, bright red tomatoes, mm. almost all identical shapes, and they are sold on the vine. You must have seen them. Uh, yeah, the slightly the smaller market. ones. Yeah, the smaller ones. And, yeah. and the most importantly, they're sold on the vine. So they're still attached to the vine. Yeah. Yeah. They're sold in little packets of three or four, and the prices are. Usually yeah. about two to three times normal loose tomatoes, yeah. but they're it's for those uh, it's for those trendy guys who wanna drizzle olive oil and oven bake it, right? All this. Yeah, 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 yeah. Correct, 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 correct. So it's for the more affluent uh, mm. people, and it's usually sold at the boutique uh, premium grocers. And so those guys are were, uh, Malaysians. Yes. Yes. So how I'm did you guys? How did so, so your good friend is also Malaysian as well, the, the CEO. Yes, yes, he's based in Singapore, but he's Malaysian. Ah, Married okay. to a Singaporean. Right, that's the link. Right, right, right. Yeah, so, um, so they started. We were really excited because you know, we saw the prices of trust tomatoes and they sold well. Uh, mm. We were fully expecting that they do very, very well. But along the way, I think they encountered many, many problems which many smallholder farmers face you know they've got issues being too small in size they don't have any bargaining power they have mm. uh, you know issues with managing their workers managing finances and the reliability of one or two buyers means they're really at risk you know when these buyers don't buy from them so long mm. long you know if you fast forward three and a half years down the road they were facing so many problems and they weren't making money so they had to close mm. down on the farm so oh, we were there okay. when the farm started. We were there when the farm was closing down, and a few of us, you know, basically, we were just talking about those issues, and we realized that hey, in this table, we have got people who started and exited their own companies in digital products, digital and brands, mm. which is my CEO and previous founder, myself, who you know spent my entire life developing processes, developing systems, and controls. We have got smallholder farmers and we have got real estate uh, people, people from the real mm. estate industry who build you know, retail and commercial buildings. And among just the six of us, we could literally solve the their problems from from seed to sale, what we call it, the entire mm. uh, uh, value chain. So we thought that hey, we 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 seem to be on something here, you know, but uh, you know, we're not sure, so we, we, we worked on it, we worked on the idea, we tried to have different permutations, but soon we realized, you know, smallholder issues, you can't just solve one and hope that the rest of the problems fall in place. You literally have to organize or orchestrate your entire solution as a value chain and offer it as a value chain to the supply, to the smallholder farmers before it works. Mm. So, so, hang on. We, we try, um, mm. So you're saying, so after you came back from your MBA, um, the six of yeah. you got together, a couple of them already was in the industry and you guys yeah. started this, uh, the, the farm for the tomatoes and still with the so six they, of the you. Two of them, the two of them started for tomatoes. Ah, okay. only, that two, only that two guys started the tomato farms. It failed. And when ah. it failed, the, the few of us came together and we, we, ah, were, okay. we happened to be there. And we were talking about the problem, and then we realized, mm. hey, this is a problem and solved mm. with all the skill sets among us. And that's so how it's it all through, started. yeah. So it's through their experience, I guess, is what you guys are trying to solve, yeah. right? Because they went through the whole cycle yeah. of setting this up and then and closing it down, if you like, right? And then yeah, so not, not myself personally, not myself. Yeah, but those two guys. Mm. Correct. So the two guys on our uh, the the two smallholder farmers on our in our team, basically between the both of them, uh, they have started open farms and greenhouse farms across four different states in Malaysia. Mm. And uh, the, the techniques that they use, which we employ uh, in, our, in our growing methods of the crops that we've selected, 
uh, you know, vertication and hydroponics, also things that they have, you know, basically done before. So the mm. growing methods, so-called the modern farming, and this is something which our team is actually very experienced in. So how did the fee five four uh, come about? Well, that that was the origination of the story. Uh, mm. we, we 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 knew that something like this was what's missing in this space. And if you look at the agri tech landscape now, you've got many people that are doing pockets of, of wonderful things, right? You've got one big vertical that's all around vertical farming, uh, using indoor aircon, lighting, and all that mm. stuff to grow green leafies, and uh, a lot of uh, attraction. I think they're doing, doing great stuff as well. Uh, they've got people who are using drones and visual processing to help with uh, recognition of problems, etc. There are people who are in the space of chemicals and products, automation, etc., etc. But many of this these products or agri tech solutions, so to speak, they aren't really built for smallholder farmers. Mm. You go to a farmer and ask them, would you like to use a drone? They'd be like, why do I want to do that? Right? Yeah. And if you go to a farmer, this is a microbiome product that can do wonders for your crop, but it costs you, I don't know, a small little bottle, uh, 50 USD, for example, and they're thinking mm. that's too much. So many of them are actually not tailored to go after the smallholder farmers. They are they are they are really you know meant for targeting uh, the the big you know agri businesses or conglomerates or corporates or cooperatives, which would then you know take on these products. And if it ever trickles down to the smallholder farmers, usually it's on government subsidy or as part of the big you know uh, agri business uh, supply chain solution. Mm. So we we realize that. You know, there really is a need for something like this in the industry. You want to help smallholders. You want to make smallholder farming profitable again and sustainable. Something like what we are doing is necessary. Uh, but again, you know, you could quickly see, you know, if we want to do what we do effectively, uh, it's a lot of capex. And we are taking on the capex and translating that heavy capital investment into a affordable, accessible operating expense for the smallholder farmers so that they can, they can access all these um, advanced you know infrastructure modern advanced farming infrastructure and and and, and systems to, uh, for modern farming and we of course could see you know some difficulties in that we have to raise lots of money before we can do what mm. we do but before you go try, there but before things. you go there maybe help understand help me understand so exactly what does fee do what do you guys do? <laughs> I people? was wondering when the question will come along. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, okay. So we, Fee Five Four, we call ourselves Technology First Co-Farming Company. Now, sorry. When did you When did you establish? Coming in. When did you establish Fee Five Four? As Fee Five Four established uh, last year. Okay. Fairly new. 20, 2019, uh, February, March, hmm. in Singapore. And then the Sandian Bahat in Malaysia is a subsidiary. So it's, it is our self-operated master licensee, self-operated uh, master licensee of the co-farming model, so to speak. Mm. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Mm. What do you guys do? Yeah, the aircon is on, it's so warm. Well, when the topic gets okay. tougher. Eh? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think it was like the lights on. I have to turn on the lights so that at least you can see. If not, the lights come from the window. It looks weird. Okay, so I was saying, um, <coughs> Fee 5 we call ourselves a mm. uh, technology-first co-farming company. And our mission is to empower a, a new generation of smallholder farmers in Southeast Asia, not just mm. Malaysia. Mm. So what we call co-farming is when, you know, contract farming with guaranteed buyback of crops meets ready to farm spaces so we marry these two together effectively we're using technology on the back of a business model innovation to allow easy access to modern inf modern farming infrastructure and system for smallholders to start their own modern farms okay too many, big, side, too, too many big words i don't understand any of that okay so how it works for us is we turn Okay, let's see how it should. We take down long-term agri-land lease. 
anywhere okay. from 20 to 25 years. We built modern uh, farm spaces that uses modern farming systems like fertigation and hydroponics that's mm. being grown under protected environments. So in greenhouses or in open farming fields where we fully mulch the floor with either silver shine or wheat mat so that we can perform some kind of a protection from the environment. And we don't grow from the ground, we grow from grow bags with, with uh, growing medium like cocoa husk. We deliver water and uh, nutrition via drip, via water and drip tubes. Yeah. So this mm. is a this is this is a common uh, modern way of farming, but it's very expensive. So mm. a greenhouse, you know, uh, could easily be let's say eighty eighty thousand, saying two hundred and ten to two hundred and forty RM thousand to build uh, an example, a greenhouse of one acre size uh, and, and mm. a, a fertigation system could easily cost 50, 60, 70, 50, 60, 70 RM thousand to uh, basically set up for one acre. So these are mm. expensive infrastructure. And although many smallholder farmers know the, the good of using such system, uh, they cannot afford it. So mm. typically people will not argue with you if... Um, from if you move from traditional farming using you know the till and hole on the ground and you move it into greenhouse using fertigation, you easily get about five to six times more yield. That's 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 okay. People usually won't uh, argue with you um, because traditional farming is 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 very fraught with a lot of uh, uncertainties. You know, if you have got monsoon, heavy rains, and three four months of the year you don't grow, and any other problems with the land around your site the issues with the ground, uh, yeah. you have bad yield. Consistency in terms of the volume and the yield quality is quite low when you, when you, when you do traditional uh, farming without any of this help. Mm. Yeah? So what we do is we take down long-term lease land. We build modern farming facilities that have all these greenhouses, make use of all these crop systems, and we pre-curate the crops which we grow in our space. So we make sure that the crops that we accept in our network, we know how to go, number one. Mm. Two, is profitable enough to support these agropreneurs on a pure OPEX model so that they come in, they, although their operational expenses is higher because of the rental that they pay to us, the, the profit sharing that they pay for us, they are still able to take back a 50, 70,000 RM per year per minimum crop plot. Mm. So they join but, us, what we do, Mm. So if you are, if if e five four has gone through the trouble of raising the mm. funds, getting the lease, you know, and spending the capex to set all this up, why do you even bother trying to enable all the small farmers? Why don't you just do it for yourselves and just get workers and just produce for cool, yourselves? Cool. Cool. We see ourselves as the purveyor of physical space, modern crop, modern farming space and the purveyor of modern farming digital platform that can help the smallholders grow consistently. We don't want in a space, we, want, we don't want to be in the space of being our growers ourselves because that's, that limits the, the ambition of the company or the vision of the company. Hmm. As a grower, if I was a in Johor, you know, I would sell to all the supermarkets in Singapore. I myself may own 20, 30 acres growing myself and I contract out all the farming, all the produce out to smallholders. I buy back from them and I'll, I'll sell to Singapore. I have a tidy profit, two, three, four million RM a year. I'm happy. Hmm. And that, that's it. And, and having to manage that and grow everything on your bottom line is also limiting. As just the purveyor of the space and the purveyor of the digital platform that can ensure growers can grow consistently, suddenly we lift those limits. Mm -hmm. We are able to grow as big and as fast and as far uh, uh, far spread as there's land in Southeast Asia and as there are agropreneurs in Southeast Asia, smallholder mm -hmm. farmers in Southeast Asia. And mm -hmm. if you look at this demographic, it's huge. So we have got Southeast Asian um, agri agricultural economy at, I think, 256 billion USD. That was, I think, two years ago, a report from uh, FAO. 
um, eighty percent of that is grown by smallholders. Mm. So that's a staggering number, and sixty percent of that eighty percent is contract farming. So you have got all these smallholder farmers whose livelihood is depending on growing small amounts that cater for big sale agreements that mm. that provides livelihood for all the B for the bottom of the b- bottom of the, the hierarchy uh, demographic of people. We so want help me to sell guys. Help me understand the, the market for contract farming because obviously that's not my space at all. So how does that work today, even before P54? How does the mm-hmm. industry work with small farmers selling it to uh, large contract farmers? And who are the players out there? Yeah. Well, players, there are many. Uh, and like I said, you know, if you look at the supermarkets, any of those uh, that are packed up on the shelves and you see uh, a, a company logo like a... Those are all typically contract buyers themselves. So how it works um, normally, and, and you have got contract farming does take many, many shapes and forms. But one mm. of the most common ones is uh, the buyer will specify uh, a certain crop they want to buy back. And they will provide maybe the seeds and they'll provide some high level instructions on how to grow these crops so that you will mm. grow what they want mm-hmm. and off the agropreneur goes. The farmer goes and grows, he uses the seed. Sometimes uh, the buyer will provide uh, chemicals or, or nutrients as well. They will use mm. these chemicals and nutrients and they will grow whatever that is being asked of them. And then they take that harvest back to the buyer when it's ready and say, here, here you go. But so it's normally, a, is, is it normally an exclusive relationship between the, the small farmers with these large ones? And so like they kind of they kind of stuck. The hmm. That's the and that's ultimately the problem. Hmm. Uh, very very big companies they may have contracts in place, so it's actually hmm. legal binding. Many many small companies who are involved in contract farming they don't bother. It's just verbal. You grow, I give you this. You go and grow. You come back. I'm gonna pay you this X amount of money. And and then by and large it works. But even if there's contracts or not, the problem is, is, is something that cannot be policed. What are you going to do? You're going to sue a small farmer? It's not going to happen, right? Mm. So in contract farming, one of the biggest issues is with consistency in the volume of supply and the quality of the crops. So these guys, you know, if they don't grow using modern techniques like hydroponics or, or fertigation or under a greenhouse, the quality varies is, and the variation is very large. And there's also no loyalty to the buyer whatsoever. If uh, someone else outside the networks offer them one cent more, they would sell. So when you when you have got uh, markets that run up, like for example, if you're growing like a crop like chili, during seasonal periods, the price of chili can go very, very high. Mm-hmm. And during those times, these guys won't sell to the contract people. They will go to the contract buyer and say, oh, sorry, this harvest, you know, or oh, pest attack, or this problem, that problem, no crop but they have already sold it to someone else for more than what you have offering him. And during markets where it's low, and, you, and sometimes when the market price is lower than the contract price, they will be happily running with their harvest to the contract buyer. Say, we have a contract. You have to honor the contract. You have to pay me. And that's the problem with contract farming. It's, it's very mm-hmm. hard to prove. So when we do it our way, our growers come to our spaces. We have physical controls is designed into the, 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 how the farms are being built, controls around which delivery trucks are supposed to come in because we provide the growing protocols through digital means on our platform. We also mm. know when plot A, plot B farmer is supposed to harvest, how much are we expecting and, the, and how much should the delivery truck be collecting to, to, to sell to the buyers. So these are how we solve some of these problems mm. against contract farming. Mm. So you guys started in early last year. So, yes. so what's happened for the last one year? Where are you guys at from the beginning? Yeah, so the last one year had really been a lot about firming up uh, how co farming should be like, what is the idea, how should we execute it. Then the team basically split up to do many, many things. We first uh, had to identify what are the crops we want to grow. 
Mm. So our farming guys and our team started going through the list of crops that they knew how to grow and they know where to sell to and they start pulling out all the numbers that I needed. And then we took that numbers and we did a financial model. We do very rigorous financial modeling around all the crops to see, okay, chili works, uh, rock melon works, mini brinjal works, ginger works, lettuce works. And when I say work, which means if you consider all the growing costs plus uh, the cost of our space, the cost of the crop profit share, can the agropreneur still make a profit that makes sense? And by what we make sense is about 50 to 70,000 RM a year per minimum crop plot. So we do that modeling. We make sure that we get the, the numbers right. That it's really ground up. The price is right. We establish the buyer. So we actually have established buyers for all the crops that uh, we are growing in our space. Mm. Uh, we know the price. We know, we make sure we develop the protocols to grow. So we know how many points, what is the number of plants per point, what's the yield per plant, and we built the, 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 the whole financial model from ground upwards to see which one is profitable. Mm. Then we started looking out for suppliers in terms of greenhouse and, and, and crop systems and you know started working with them. Today, two of the biggest suppliers of the heaviest KPEX, the most expensive items basically in co-farming, are also an investor in T54. So mm. that's how we work with suppliers to ensure that we have control around cost. Then we started looking out for land and we started mm. looking out for partnerships in terms of technology, etc. etc. Uh, putting that whole thing together and finally started fundraising. So when we we uh, uh, when we incorporated ourselves in, in February, March last year, uh, we were finally confident enough to start fundraising late last year around September. So from, from February to September, basically uh, the company is being run by paid up capital that's put up by the founders ourselves. Mm. So our, our small farmer team members in Malaysia, in our team, they are being paid. Um, some of the directors are drawing a little bit as well. And then basically all the operational expenses that's being bootstrapped by us for all these months. So we have started our fundraising around September. Uh, then, you know, we, we, we had to restructure our company a little bit into what it looks like today, the legal entity bit. Uh, and then, you know, the year end period and all that started really, really fundraising in January. So by now, I think we are quite close to uh, the target that we need to start a small pilot farm. Uh, we have secured ourselves an 18-acre space in Negri Sembilan Vantau. Right. So that's a, that's a wonderful, wonderful space um, that we, we like. There's water, there's electricity. It's one and a half hours from KL. Uh, it's more than really flat, so that we don't want to spend too much into clearing all that stuff. So right now on the land, what we are, what we are doing is we, are do, we have started the land survey already and doing farm planning. Uh, we are bringing in our, our, our greenhouse uh, supplier to look at the land to see how we're going to position uh, the, the greenhouses uh, in, which, in which part of the land. Because when you use greenhouses in tropical land, there's a lot of signs behind it. You have mm. got to put it in a direction where the wind is going to be crossing. And in this part of our world, uh, because of monsoon, wind, wind direction changes. So ah, choosing okay. where to put the greenhouse and the direction of the greenhouse makes a lot mm. of difference in whether the natural ventilation within the greenhouse is good. Right. But there's a lot of that that's going on, the farm planning and all that stuff is going on. Um, and uh, we're hoping to start uh, truly operating uh, by June. So things that we have done by now, uh, we have started our roadshow with UPM. Uh, uh, in Malaysia, I think two and weeks I ago. Think, I think that's the post that I saw on uh, uh, LinkedIn. And this is where yeah. you're actually now looking for the agropreneurs themselves. Correct. Actually, we have already identified the first three agropreneurs that will start with us in our five-acre pilot uh, farm space. Uh, we're going through the roadshow to collect more people who are interested because there is a there is a there is a process that we put people through to assess mm. whether or not they 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 make the they make the cut to join us. Uh, we're mm. looking out for people who are 
passionate about growing, who are serious about starting this in, in a career, this business, because farming is, no matter how high tech we make it, no matter how you know, uh, structured we make it, farming is still farming. You're going to spend a lot of time under the sun. It is you know, mm. comparatively more comfortable than an office job. So we need to make sure that, hey, and you guys are serious, yeah? The, the, it's yeah. going to be profitable for you. You're going to be earning as much as your friends in KL who's holding a, a office job. But, you know, you need to want to have a farmer's mm. life. So mm. these are the things that we put people through. So UPM's uh, roadshow was quite a success. We have about 50 people signing up. So we're going mm. through that list now and them to give us more information, you know, arranging for them to meet up uh, over a video call to talk more about and what we're trying to do is put down a pipeline of uh, agropinners who are going to drop to to join us, so that we can we can align the the uh, uh, the development of our space with the onboarding of agropinners. So how does that work from an agropinner standpoint who's interested to do this? Right. Um, a couple of questions come to mind. Number one is. Do I have to come as a team? What's the minimum number of people, you know, to run this? How much money do I need to bring to the table? And also, um, do I get to pick how big the land is and what I grow on it? So how does that work? Okay, very good questions. So we have three types of uh, farm spaces that will be on offer. Two right now, one later. So uh, lowland open farming. That goes for 1,003 RM per month per acre. Lowland greenhouse, that goes for 4,003 RM per month per acre. And highland greenhouse, 6,000 RM per month per acre. All the agropreneur need to do, should they pass our screening process, is to put up three months of deposit. So if you're mm. growing a, a lowland uh, open farm, you need to take down minimum two acres because we've done our, our modeling for mm. open farm crop chili. You need to run two acres before you can make enough money. For a uh, rock melon, we just let them run one acre because with one acre of rock melon greenhouse, it's more expensive to grow, but it's also more, pro it's also more uh, profitable. You, with one acre, you will be profitable enough. So there is the concept of minimum crop plot the agropreneur comes and take down the minimum crop plot for anywhere from three to five years. When they join us, they just pay that three month deposit. We put them through some training. Really, it's about understanding how to go about running their farm using our digital platform. Mm. And our digital platform really runs their farm from seed to sale. So it first digitalizes the financial model of all the crops that we grow, the growing methods and the protocols of the crops that we grow, that's all digitalized on our platform. Mm. It helps them set aside enough funds so that they can start the new harvest of, of uh, a new cycle of uh, crops every time. Mm. It helps them buy the right agri inputs in the right amounts. It helps them grow consistently through digitalized uh, 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 SOPs, we call it standard operating procedures, which can be easily assigned to their workers and monitored for progress. They will also use DDFN to tap the broader wisdom of all the other farmers who are growing the same crop as them to solve problems. It is also the channel where they reach out to FIFA full staff and our expert panel to help them with problem solving. Last of all, FIFA, uh, the, the, our digital platform also helps them with the workflow of harvesting, sorting, packing, and selling. So we help mm. them with rampant fraud there's a lot of issues around workers colluding with drivers. Mm. They will take some of your produce and they sell outside and they pocket the money or they will steal your packaging, they'll pack something else in it and sell also pocketing the money. So mm. digital process and controls help to reduce rampant fraud as well as to account for sales and rejects. Buyers sometimes also reject uh, you know, things that are, that are delivered to them. Sometimes mm. it is valid. Sometimes it is not. So we have process and controls in place where we check with the buyers. We see through video call, why are you trying to reject a certain thing? And if it's, if it's valid, we accept it. And when it comes back to our farm, we account it to the right farmer. That way, 
all our agropreneurs, although they are all consolidated and sold to one buyer, they know exactly how profitable they are at any point in time because we count for each farmer's sale and rejects. Mm. So that our, our digital platform literally has their entire farm living on it. And it helps them right from the day one to the moment they sell their, their crops. So it's from seed to sale, so, so, so to speak. Mm. So it, and that's, that's all there is to do. We help them with mm. workers. We have partnerships with worker agencies where we are bringing in people who we have set criteria on how much we're going to pay, what kind of experience we want. They will, they will choose who they want. They will hire who they want. These guys will be in our farm. There's accommodation in our farm. There's packing centers and delivery centers in our farm. There's nurseries in our farm. These are all the common infrastructure which is shared among all the agropreneurs in our space and they just operate their own minimum crop plot. Mm. So if I'm interested to join, obviously you need to interview me to say, hey, you know, beyond playing golf in the hot sun, you can do this every day as well. Um, yeah. I'll need to pay. So it's almost like a, a leasing, right? So I pay depending on the size, say the one acre. So I pay about, what was it? 1,008 a month, right? Now, mm. and with that monthly payment, um, so it comes obviously with all the technology. Did you say it also comes with the required number of workers as well? Or yes. that's something that I have to pay? So the, the crop model that we have built basically includes all the cost of, build, of growing that crop. So mm. we, when they join us, oh, I, think I, main, I think I left out one very key thing. We will, product, we will also provide them a pre-harvest loan. Because many of these farmers actually join our space they don't have enough to buy the first set of agri inputs. They don't have mm. enough to pay workers before the first harvest proceeds comes in. So we help them with that, that initial pre-harvest loan. So when they come in, they pay us the deposit. We set up them in their physical space. We set them up in our digital platform. They will see in their e-wallet, okay, this is the loan balance I have. They use that starting, starting amount to buy the first set of agri inputs to pay their workers before the first harvest income come in. And the mm. whole crop model has been built in a way whereby by the time you sell your first harvest, you would have enough to earmark for the next harvest and to pay your, your workers the next, uh, uh, for the next cycle as well while being profitable. So whatever that is profit over and on top of the earmark amount, it goes mm. into an available balance for them to draw down. Mm. So, you mentioned this is a five acres pilot first, right? Um, I yes. guess the, the risk, I mean, all that sounds great, but when we look at the current COVID situation, right? Um, oh. You know, obviously there's going to be some supply issues. Um, uh, I don't know what the pricing is going to be like. With the panic buying, you might even double the, the, the price of the veggies, right? Um, but assuming is the opposite. Assuming... Um, there are pests or the wind stops blowing the right way, as you said, right? Uh, was, and and the awesome. crops, yeah, and, and the and crops do not fruit as the yield is not as much. And I guess the, is that then the risk the farmers, the agripreneurs take because at the end of the month they still have to pay you the the monthly. Yes, uh, I think you're very very right. Um, at the end of the day, farming is still farming. Farmers live and die by the weather. That doesn't change with us. We do make it a lot easier. Mm. So when, we, when, when, I, I, when I said previously that the growing protocols of each crop we have already developed and digitalized, it goes right down to a set of integrated pest management policies. It also goes right down to exact steps on what to do or what the workers and the agropreneurs themselves should do to monitor the crop so that we know whether they are doing well along the way and not just at the harvest. So it includes things like at week four, you should expect the first trust to flower. At week five, you expect the first trust of flowers to fruit. At week six, you're expecting fruits of certain size, certain color. Week seven, week mm. eight before you harvest. So it is down to the kind of granular level. So we know as the, the workers complete their tasks and give feedback through our digital platform, collecting all that data, we know how the farmers are doing. And it includes steps that are you know, basically good practice, like how do you monitor for pest population? Uh, how do you monitor or how do you keep your space clean? 
uh, so that you have a good clean farm. And when you practice all of these principles together, it's what people call an integrated pest management framework. And when you do that, uh, you actually have very, or you bring down the risk of pest attacks or bad crops due to issues like uh, uh, you know, uh, problems with, with insects or whatnot to the very minimum. Mm. So that, the, how we are structured, the way we are helping our agropreneurs through our digital platform does bring down that risk to a certain extent. Mm. And when you talk about COVID, uh, I think in this scenario, it probably brings up the prices of crops more than anything rather than bring it down. Mm. Uh, uh, so that's not going to be an issue as far as, and it's a good thing that we're not in operations now because it, it gives us uh it makes us think about something very important. If this is to happen while we're in operations, how then do we help the workers who are staying in the accommodation? How do we take safety steps to make sure the workers who are affected are then brought to proper health care mm. and, and uh, mm. et cetera? The good thing is it is within our premise. We have control over the physical security. The, com the workers do stay 24-7 on, uh, on the premises. So it's a lot about messaging. This is, this is a problem now. Workers need to not leave the farm unless it's absolutely necessary. We can make arrangements to bring food to them, etc., etc. We do have leisure you know, facilities in the farm so that they can play basketball, they can play tennis. They're not, they're not in a jail, right? So, so all of these, I mean, it has helped us think a lot. I think we need to build some of this into the design of our farm. So definitely, I think, touch wood, if this happens again, while we are in operations, we should be more or less uh, have a few steps that we have prepared to, 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 to safeguard ourselves. Mm. And for the third question around what happens if um, environment is bad, as much as possible, we grow our crops under protected environment, under a greenhouse helps with rainfall, helps with heavy wind, uh, helps with insects and animals. So a lot of that is being helped, is again then being, being, being helped by how and the infrastructure that we use. Um, droughts, acts of God, that's mm. nothing we can do. But one thing we are working towards is with all the data that we are collecting around uh, agropreneurs, their farm operations, their finances, their harvest sales, etc. We're taking all that data together and we are actually working with UTM right now on a machine learning AI project. We're using this data for two purposes. One, how do we measure farm performance using worker performance? Two, mm -hmm. how do we develop a forward-looking credit model? where we use alternative data sets like actual data from the farm, actual harvest, actual worker behavior to assess if, okay, this new farmer who wants to join fee 54 should he be given a loan because he is a university graduate, he stays in this place, he's going to grow chili in fee 54 he's going to sell to this buyer, he uses Cellcom, for example, this kind of information, can we build an alternative forward-looking credit model whereby mm. new agropreneurs can access to smallholder loans and smallholder crop insurance? And when we get there, many of these issues can also be helped because crop insurance is something that's not common in our part of the world because it's just no data for insurers to work on to underwrite this risk. Mm. So on that, yeah. in terms of monitoring of the farm performance, are you guys using a lot of yeah. IoT at all to, to track the, I don't know, the soil and uh, those kind of things? Not a lot. Not in the main footprint of our spaces, at least for now. Uh, but for the two or three acres that we're setting aside for this research work with UTM, uh, yes, we do intend to put in some IoT sensors uh, where we're monitoring things like temperature, humidity, uh, etc. cetera. And that will form part of the data that goes into the broader data sets from DDFN for, for machine learning applications. But as far as IoT is concerned, I think, I mean, people may disagree with me, it's slightly overhyped at this point. Mm. Um, it's not at the stage where, I mean, people, how people are using IoT? They are, they are monitoring sunlight intensity, uh, temperature, humidity, and it's controlling a fully automated greenhouse, for example. Uh, 
uh, that actually increases the cost of greenhouse by quite significantly. Yeah, sure. And we have done that before. It makes actually the cost of the crop growing higher and then the need for a higher price also as a, as a result. So by and large, I think until the cost of such technologies get brought down, it's actually not very suitable for smallholders at this point in time. Other usage of IoT is they are overhyped, is, or you can use IoT, for example, to, and it's fully automated. You won't need a single person in the farm. The farm will water itself. The farm will know how much nutrients. That is sci-fi at the moment. I don't, I don't think that one, that wouldn't come one day. It's just not now. I mean, we have a very, we know because we tried, uh, a very uh, uh, real constraint. How do you put the IoT in the back to realistically measure the, the input uh, nutrient combination? It's mm. different when you put it here. It's different when you put it here. It's different when you put it here. Mm. Mm. That's not the concept. You're unable to get. So when you do that, you end up having very jumbled data. And to do that, you also need to have one sensor in each back. In one acre, we are growing 5,000 minimum planting points. Yeah. Yeah. 5,000 IoT sensors in one acre of farm, the cost is going to be prohibitive as well. So, yeah. how it is promising, I think many of this is not ready. We are studying, we always have at the back of our heads research to try and bring in these technologies as quickly and as cheaply as we can. But uh, the reality is, it's not ready yet. Mm. So back to the, the pilot and your fundraising. Um, mm. So are you raising funds to kick off the pilot or is the pilot something that you're going to try to prove a point and therefore then use that uh, to raise the funds? And how are you raising it's, funds? It's both. It's both. So we have been raising funds uh, since late last year till now. Uh, and a combination of the few uh, legal structures that we have, we have raised about eight hundred and fifty thousand Sing dollars. Mm. Uh, How is that done? enough? To... Sorry. How is that done so far? The fundraising. Uh, so we are raising some money at the private limited top code that's re that is incorporated in Singapore, uh, and then we have raised uh, some money at the technology subsidiary where we are building the technology. Mm. So that one is no. taken care of. It's what I mean. For uh, what I mean is the, the source of funds itself. Are these angels, VCs, are uh, using a platform? Angels, tech investors. Uh, so in Malaysia, uh, for the Sendian Bahat, who is actually going to run the coal farming uh, the operations, we are starting a equity crowdfunding uh, exercise with Ata Plus. Mm. So raising up to 4.5 million RM there through a crowd equity crowdfunding platform. So we, we okay. like that because I think this is a story that resonates very well with, with many people and many people actually do see the good of what we do. And by going through an equity crowdfunding platform, we bring the, uh, the, the investment barrier way down. The minimum the, is still, it's still in the works now, it's still interim, but the minimum uh, uh, block size is going to be 3000 RM, I think. So it's really going to be really, really accessible to people. We're hoping that, that we can bring, uh, you know, a masses of retail investors in. Uh, that's also to help part of the crowdfunding. Of course, we need a lot more than that because there's a lot of uh, expensive capex to buy and, uh, and, and etc. Uh, so by and large, that's it. We have we have we have raised enough for the technology, and that's being built now. We we'll raised some at private limited, which is being. Uh, put into the Sendian Bahat as paid up capital and is being run is running the, the Sendian Bahat now, um, and we're going to raise another five uh, in RM, uh, 1.5 mil RM, to to fully kickstart that uh, five uh, five acre uh, at at our eight our, our eighteen acres uh, piece of land. Mm. Yeah. So with the funding that you have raised already. Um, you said you have secured the 18 acres um, and within mm. that you've got the five acres that you guys are piloting with the three agro farmers. Mm. So what's, what's the timing like for these three uh, lab rats of an agro farmer? When is their first yield coming in and uh, you know, when you see some revenues coming from there? 
You're not lab rats, okay? <laughs> we are the lab rats. We, they have it all set up for them. They come in and they just, oh, do it and they just do it. Um, okay, but it's a good question. Uh, so, of these three agroponiers, uh, there will be one chili uh, agroponier, one chili mm. grower who grows acres, and two rock melon growers growing one acre each. So, okay. rock melon is two and a half month crop. So our target is start in June. Uh, they will probably they will be onboarded in June. They probably start growing in July. So uh, July, August, uh, September, mm -hmm. they would have the first uh, rock melon harvest. Uh, Chile will be six months later. Mm. So how yeah. many? Ha okay. So if the rock melon, did you say a month, month and a half? Two and a half months. Uh, two and a half months. So they could potentially take. You they potentially can have four cycles. A year uh, for the rock melons. Yes. Mm. They will have four cycles in a year, and that's inclusive of turnaround time between uh, between each cycle. So how we how we do it is uh, within one acre, we, we will split it in a number of sections. Uh, the usual the the rationale is so that we can have a more consistent delivery of uh, produce, uh, and we'll stagger uh, each section within the acre. Uh, a little bit so that you know um, you know you have got planting harvest planting harvest so that on a week by week basis there's some produce coming out so it makes it easier for us to deliver to our buyer so basically so so that's done and in between each cycle there's also a turnaround time where you need to mm. get rid of old crop and start the new one and all that stuff so all of that included they will have four cycles a uh, year for rock mm. melon and the prices for the produce that's already fixed in, uh, in terms of the bias that you've, you've uh, yep. locked in so one of the criteria before we accept a crop into our network is that there is already an established buyer or we know which buyer which we're very confident to be able to establish a buying relationship with and that typically comes with the floor price so there's the x amount of money uh, mm. for this crop uh, anything if the market moves up by a certain percentage then, then the prices will adjust as well so there are this kind of different arrangements with the different buyers and, and basically yes uh, if we accept a crop into our network and we're pushing it to our agropreneurs which means these guys don't have to worry about who to sell to we consolidate mm. their harvest as a network we deliver to the buyer for them mm. what's the so timing like mm. Mm. No, Go ahead, uh, i'm just saying that our, is only focus on growing, solving problems in their own farm, managing their workers, etc. etc. They don't have to worry about the peripherals, uh, they don't have to worry about sales, they don't have to worry about finance, they don't have to worry about logistics, etc. Hmm. So, what's the plan for the remaining 13 acres? Um, when do you hope to get those guys uh, filled up as well? Yeah, so. So we have met a lot, a lot of investors along the way. Uh, many of them are very interested uh, in, in coming into the, into the business. Uh, they're basically waiting for the first five acre show farm, you know, for us to get it done mm. and proving that, hey, this is the concept. This is exactly how we're going to do it. Uh, so you can be, you can be not so worried now that we are, we know how to grow, and uh, and 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 they're they're ready to move to come in. So. Um, the plan for the rest of the 18 acres and beyond is really to uh, uh, raise the funds that we need and then systematically rolling up the farm. So we're mm. planning out this 18 acres as one nucleus farm. So we already know what we're going to do for the 18 acres. Once the funding is in, then we will expand to the areas that we want. And the five acres mm. is where we will be built. Uh, and we start there because that's also where the business center and all the common common infrastructure is going to be situated the accommodations the nurseries the delivering and packing centers etc and the rest of it is just expanding the farm operation site mm. yeah how big is the team from 354 yourself uh right now it's six uh the operation site and then on the technology side we have another team of five so together we have about 11. Mm. Okay, and yeah. I guess the bottom line is, how are you guys making money apart from getting the monthly rentals from the entrepreneurs? Yep, so that is one revenue. Uh, we call that farm space and service rental. 
So how we come up with that thousand four or four thousand three or six thousand RM per acre per month is essentially the cost, the amortized cost of us providing that space with a markup. So that's farm space is the rental. But the majority of our revenue comes from crop profit sharing for agropreneurs. We are doing that because we want to align our interests with the agropreneurs. We want to do well when they do well. We want to make sure that whatever that we are putting into our digital platform, which is what they are using to support their growing, mm. works and it works well for them uh, before you know, we also do well. So that's mm. the two main new lines that were from Farm Space to Service Rental, Crop Profit Sharing. Mm. Uh, oh, I forgot to ask, for, for the guys who sign up um, as an mm -hmm. agropreneur, is there a locking period? What, how does that work? Three to five years. So we have this pre-harvest loan that we are uh, prepared to extend to the agropreneurs. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes about anywhere from 70,000 RM to 110,000 RM to start one cycle. If you don't have this money, are prepared to extend that loan to you if we extend that loan to you you need to sign a five-year lease with us because the loan tenure is going to be for five years if you don't sign if you don't take up a pre-harvest loan you can somehow back still borrow uncle auntie or you happen to also have a little bit of money from, mm. from your family you are able to afford that 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 pre-harvest portion of the fund we actually encourage entrepreneurs not to take it up because the difference in the installment does move the needle for them. Mm. So if they don't take the harvest loan from us, uh, the minimum tenure is three years. Okay. And Five if they years. do take and if they do take the loan from you, and let's say they're one of those guys who want to plow the money back, how many years do you think they are able to just pay the loan um, off? Is it within the first year, second year of, of harvest? Well, it's difficult to say because it depends on how tight they want to tighten their belt uh, mm. during this period. So our our financial model incorporates a minimum salary for agropreneurs, which they're allowed to take away before we account for the profits. So mm. anywhere from thousand five to thousand two, they get to draw out from the year mark amounts, uh, and that is not part of the profit. So they do draw a small stipend, so to speak. Mm. Mm. The profits anywhere from fifty to seventy thousand RM a year, they decide how much they want to plow back in. Uh, but I, I think it's it's tough because living standards in, in Malaysia is not a yeah. so very low yeah. kind of earning level. If you have a family to feed and all that, it's also difficult. Uh, I would highly encourage people to put prepay some. Maybe you can get your 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 loan done by three instead of five. But mm. anything below three you'll probably be living a very hard life. Mm. Yeah, you'll be eating your own tomatoes, I guess. Before you think, well. I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I, yeah, I just have a couple more questions. Um, number one is back to the uh, fundraising. So with mm. Ataplas, uh, when are you guys going to kick off the campaign? Because of COVID, it's slightly delayed. So um, we're looking at April, latest mid-April. We're actually okay. ready already. Just that mm. the, the team is now all working off-site. Uh, mm. Certain documents can appear and etc. Cetera, et cetera. So I'm kind of stuck at this point in time. Once this, we have more clarity around this, maybe the travel restrictions internally slightly more relaxed. We can go back to business as usual. Mm. So the target now is latest April, uh, mid-April. Okay. Now, when you do raise those funds, as you said, you are you have earmarked all that funding to uh, utilize the rest of the eighteen acres. So, what's mm -hmm. the plan? What's the plan beyond the eighteen acres? What's what's up? What's next? The slightly mid-term plan is to do fifty acres in Malaysia within two years. And then within in the second year, to do 25 acres in Indonesia. So within the first two years, 75 acres. And according to our revenue forecast, we're going to break even somewhere around 25 acres. And at 50 acres, we will already be profitable. So how we are building this business is we want to always think about um, profitability first. Uh, and, 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 and avoid all these problems that's in the startup world now. So at 50 acres, we're profitable. We raise to expand. We don't raise to survive. I think that's uh, 
the right way to do business. Mm. Mm. Will you be the looking to plan, mm. go ahead? The broader plan, broader Southeast Asian plan is to do five, six countries, uh, 5,000 acres in 10 years. Mm. So we'll do Malaysia first, Indonesia, Thailand, and Philippines, uh, Vietnam, and Myanmar, six. Mm. Cool. Yeah. Now, the other thing that's really hot in the last couple of years and uh, in terms of agri is really the Musang King Farms that, that's out there. What's, what's your take yeah. on... What's your take on that? You know, obviously the, the yield is only after, I don't know, seven, nine years, right? So is that, is, is that something that you would be looking at as well or is that a really different game altogether? We have uh, we've been asked that question many, many times. There, there are people who have bought land, they want to grow durians. Hey, what a five four idea is so good. Can I you know, adopt your model and grow durians? And well, the simple answer is not in this current model and form because um, we we focus on on fast or short harvest cycle cash crops. Uh, all the, all the crops that we are able to grow now that we're pushing the agropreneurs have a harvest cycle that's shorter than one year. And the reason really is because if there are any crops that are longer than a year, the pre harvest uh, loan or the the OPEX is going to be very very high, mm. and uh, a lot of agropreneurs will not be able to 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 take that up. So, like you said, durian is a seven year you know cycle before you can uh, harvest group, uh, mm. commercially uh, sellable. But after that, you have got a good fifteen years more to go, now, of course. So these type of uh, this type of crops, I think, is very good for the individual rich investor who has got land to do deploy. Don't think about it for seven years and then later enjoy the fruits. Mm. Um, and and I think many people who have started their durian farm seven years ago are now laughing to the bank until COVID, of course. Uh, and, but those who start now, I'm not so sure how the market will be like seven to eight years. Now. But if you've done mm. your sums thing is the uh, risk that you want to take then I think it's going to be a lucrative thing as far as 354 is concerned it doesn't really fit the model because that gestation period the germination period until before you can harvest is too long um, that the amount of money that's required to run the operations before harvest sale uh, smallholders will not be able to take it mm. Mm. hey okay man thanks a lot for for spending the hour um, thank you what I really like is the fact that, you know, you are enabling a lot of um, entrepreneurs, right? A lot of these guys who would shy away from doing farming, right? Obviously, everybody hates to KL or JB or Penang and do their salary jobs. Whereas it's just so underserved in terms of um, our farming industry, right? So just bringing the fresh blood into it. I think that's great. Hmm. Yeah. Uh this is an interesting thing because we 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 happen to be uh, uh, had a couple of conversations with UPM, and and then some of these guys were actually telling us that you know every every graduates actually have one of the lowest employability in Malaysia. Mm. You know, because of the quality of the education, uh, UPM actually in our region is is quite renowned for its agricultural degree. Uh, but really because there's this number of graduates who are out in the market, but just that few big companies, they are hiring the agri-science, the agri-engineering agri -engineering students. And then many of them are, are actually vying for you know, a fixed number of jobs. So we do see ourselves as providing an alternative uh, career path that's equally lucrative if you were to decide to take a, 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 a corporate job but in the space of growing food for people. And well, that's just not going to help the world in feeding people, but also encouraging own business ownership, encouraging entrepreneurship among the young people, bringing the new blood into an industry, which if we don't, then many of these smallholders will simply retire in another 10, 15 years. We won't have smallholders anymore. Nobody will be growing your kangkongs, your tomatoes, and, you know, and we will have basically a crop diversity crash. That's the problem that we're trying to solve. 
Mm. Great. So anyway, yep. so hopefully in what, maybe July, August, we'll do this again in your farm, hopefully. And we can see how that cool. goes. Cool, cool, cool. Okay, man. Thanks All a lot. Right. All right. Cheers. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.